We're here at the Elise Palace, where we are uh, honored to be part of the No AI Without Women Conference. And I'm so thrilled. Sasha Lucioni is here. She's the head of AI and Climate Solutions at Hugging Face, one of the great French companies that are leading the way in AI. First of all, tell people about Hugging Face. So Hugging Face is the biggest open source AI platform and the goal is really to democratize AI, to let people uh, own it, deploy it, to, um, to adapt it to their needs. So really the, we have uh, over a million models now, open source, open science models that people can download and, and fine tune on their own data and deploy uh, locally, so to make them to really democratize AI, but also in a very responsible way. So we have a lot of things about evaluation, documentation, and so I'm I'm part of a lot of that work to help people understand what they're working with, not just a black box, but I mean, still a black box, I guess, but with more information about what the data is, what it can do, what its biases are, how much energy it uses. So really, to give people this ownership of this really this this uh, revolutionary technology. And what's the most exciting thing you've seen on the platform? I think unexpected, unexpected, because you know this so well. I think that um, image captioning is really kind of an underrated AI application. Like a AI image generation, people are like, oh yeah, amazing, we do all these mid-journey things. But image captioning is actually underrated because like, we have so many uh, images out there, but like um, generating captions for people who have uh, handicaps, for example, like accessibility uh, applications, and also um, things like subtitles generation and all, like, all sorts of applications that you can't really think of, like, like describing scenes, like like helping people understand like the objects that are present. Like I think like image to text is actually one of those like applications that nobody hears about, but that's actually pretty big. Yeah, image to text. How does that work? So essentially, you take the image and first you um, do object detection to figure out what's in the image. So like a dog with a ball on a I don't know on a green lawn, and then after that you'll uh, detect what each object is and how they fit together on a scene as well. So you're not only parsing each individual object, but also like the scene, the context of the. Why isn't that on Instagram? Exactly. Like alt text should be a default on all social media platforms because even if it's not like human generated, if it's not going to be like 100%, just having like an alternative AI generated text for each image that's, that's out there could have huge implications, right? And people can tell when it's AI, yeah, right? Exactly. So you identify, how, what do you call it? Watermarking? What, yeah, you can do watermarking, exactly. You can do like straight so up labeling. you can labeling. make your watermarking? Yeah. Oh my yeah, God, yeah, make actually, your own watermark yeah. on Hugging yeah. Face. Oh, I like that. Make your own photo, text to photo or text to image. Oh, you can do everything there. You can even do a text to video now. Whoa. Yeah, it's like whoa, whoa. you do you describe a scene. It's kind of like uh, the um, like the, the the video dolly one where it's like you say, oh, like a teddy bear with a bunch of balloons that are floating up in the air, and it actually generates the whole sequence for you. That's unbelievable. It's crazy. Okay, yeah. we're gonna have to try it really after that. Yeah. Now, <laughs> let's turn to the really tough stuff: climate change, climate solutions. You're the solution lady. As you look at all, let's first go to the power, all the power that's used for AI. What are you seeing? What are you working on? That's a potential solution. So the main project I'm working on right now is called uh, AI Energy Score. And the goal is we're benchmarking all of the models we can get our hands on. So essentially mil millions of AI models on different tasks. And we're, I, I'm really inspired by the EPA's AI, uh, sorry, Energy Star program, because essentially that's how it started. They took a bunch of dishwashers and they measured their energy use. They took the same microwaves, et cetera, and they established ranges. So what's a, a range from you know, zero to 100 of a microwave oven, for example? And you can do the same thing with AI for specific tasks. So image to text, you benchmark 10,000 models that do image to text, then you establish a range, and so you can give relative comparisons. So I'm not saying this is whatever, five kilowatt hours. I'm saying this is an A plus model and this is a D model because one is a lot more energy intensive. And so we're pushing this out as um, an additional piece of information that people can, can find when they're using the Hugging Face platform. So, you know, they go on the, whatever, the Llama model from Meta and they see how good it is, they see what data it's been trained on, and they see the energy consumption and they can be like, oh, well, this, 400 billion parameter model uses 100 times more energy than this 3 billion parameter model. So I'm going to use that because at the end of the day, it's going to cost me in compute. It's going to cost me in like actual money and it's going to cost uh, power, right? Energy. That's a perfect thing for government. That's what I'm trying to, to push for. But the thing is, I think that AI is such an umbrella term that governments are still trying to 
figure out what it is that they're trying to regulate or they're trying to focus on. So, so far, it's been these high-risk systems. But at the end of the day, I think that, of course, like there are some big co tech companies that use these systems. But like your average startups or your average companies will be using more task-specific ones. They're not going to be doing like you know, chat GPT type things. They're going to be doing like object detection for self-driving cars. They're going to be doing question answering. They're going to be doing sentiment analysis. And for those specific tasks, you can easily benchmark models and compare their efficiency and give out scores and say, OK, well, if you have a model that's on 24-7 and it's used by 10 million people a day, it has to score, I don't know, B or better in terms of energy, because otherwise it's, it's wholly inefficient, right? And have you figured out what the categories are, A, for this is really terrific? Did you make up the categories? So we're going back and forth. I always love the categories on energy and, you know, whatever the issue is, right? It's, it's good to see, you know, it, it, when the weather's really bad, it's, you know, this much pollution or that. So, so I you like stars. Be, the, you should do that. Yeah, I like stars because okay. I feel like gold stars are something that people like can get, like from grade school, we've been, right. we've been given gold stars because grades, like a lot of, a lot of people like A, like B, it doesn't really have that, that much, but it's like one star model versus a five star model. Everybody wants a five star model, right? right? Sure. right? Yeah, it's like a course. hotel yeah. or a restaurant. And so yeah. I'm thinking stars. Oh, that's a good idea. So people will make up their own or you tell them how to do it? Um, so we're going to have the ones on Hugging Face are going to be uh, all the ones that, oh, the, all the open source models, but we're also trying to work with big, big tech companies. So they benchmark their internal <laughs> secret models and give us the results so we can rank them too. But obviously we've had some, some reticence and some pushback because each, each company has their secret sauce and you know, their, their secret recipe. And so they're afraid if they benchmark their model and it makes them look bad. You know, so we're right. trying to figure out what the incentive is to get big tech companies to, to play ball, essentially. But with open source, especially with Meta, you've yeah. got people building upon building exactly. upon. Exactly. So, so those, we can test all of those models. They're all up on Hugging Face. But you know, how about ChatGPT? How about uh, Gemini or whatever that Google's using? How about those models that we don't have access to? We can only query via an API. I want numbers for those. But that's, of course, harder to get because it's an actual commercial product. And you know, what you need is you need a morning show or whatever people's media thing is every Monday. Here's the energy usage, right. something like that, to integrate it because people don't think about it that way. Exactly, and then a lot of people don't even realize that AI is material. They think it's like ethereal, that they that it's just like you know this like I don't know nebulous entity, right? When you talk to Siri, Siri is not just some like AI you know uh, chatbot or AI agent. It's an actual model that that tries to detect Siri, like first, like the actual word. So there's a first model running on your phone. Then there's another model running on some server somewhere in Virginia that's actually giving They're you your all answer. In Virginia, They're by all the in way. Virginia. They I know. Are. I know. It's <laughs> the number one yeah. State. data center. Yeah. 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 And, then, and then there's like data being sent back and forth. There's like, and people just don't like, because, and also like I was talking to someone recently about image generation. They're like, well, it runs on my phone. How much energy could it use? Because I'm, I'm using mid journey on my phone. I'm like, well, the mid journey is not on your phone, it's on a data center. And they don't see that, right? No, and that's like, it's really hear. hard to make it to anchor it in like, you know how much water Virginia uses? Like there are some counties that's like, something like 60% of, of the water usage is by data centers versus like residents versus right. people, right? And so, and water and energy and, and greenhouse gases. So like, and because it's so, in material, people don't make that connection, right? When you like turn on your engine, you can smell the exhaust pipe, but when you turn on a chatbot, you don't, you don't, right. you don't feel the heat. Well, in the U.S., there's lots of conversation about Microsoft is made a deal with Exelon. It's Exelon, I believe, and it's about Three Mile Island, the nuclear. I'm from Pennsylvania. I'm from Pittsburgh. You I remember? remember what it blew. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was working on a local TV show. I remember it. I remember thinking I just messed up the household hint but it doesn't matter because I'm going to die because Three Mile Island blew. But clearly none of that happened. Yeah. Okay, but this is at the, the one thing that people talk about in the U.S. is that now nuclear energy, which many think is an opportunity. Now you're here in Europe and you're in France, yeah. number one, nuclear energy. What's your take on that? So I definitely think that the institutional way of doing it, like they've been working on it for decades here in France, like they've got processes, they've got, you know, all sorts of institutions. Things take time. Like I was actually recently, yesterday I was on a panel with the head of innovation of ODF, which is like their, their utility. And I, was, and I asked him, how, how long does it take, for example, to hook up a data center to, like a new data center to France's energy grid? He said six to nine years because they have so much red tape because that's how nuclear energy should be. It should be right. safe. 
what, my, what I'm worried about in the States is that like the big uh, move fast and break things approach of big tech that's right. been used for the last decade by, by big tech companies is going to be applied to nuclear. Yes. You know, screw the red tape. Let's move fast. Let's connect Three Mile Island to a new data center in six months. Well, it's Microsoft. They're good at stuff like that. Too. Right. And what is what kind of corners are going to get cut and what consequences? Like, do we actually want private big tech companies with their ethos of, of moving fast and bringing things to own nuclear power plants. Like for me, that's a no. But I mean, that's kind of for me, it's up to governments to kind of make the call or, or, or I don't know, democracies. And I don't I don't think that's conversations really well, happen. I yet. don't think there's the kind of regulation that you're talking about would be necessary on a large scale. It's one thing if it's three power plants in all of the United States. It's another thing. But I will tell you that there's lots of companies in the U.S. talking about these mini nuclear plants. That's, that's I don't know what that is. Yeah, yeah, actually, but what's interesting about that is that they're a very um, experimental technology. They're years away from being actually functional. So all these SMR discussions, they're like 2030 discussions. The thing is why Microsoft bought or made the um, Three Mile Island uh, Accord or whatever contract is because it's so much faster to actually put back uh, a closed nuclear power plant than to start a new one, even if it's a small one, because you're starting from scratch. And so yesterday um, I was at the IEA uh, summit about AI and energy, and they were saying for a new SMR in the, in the in small medium reactor, in the, in the nuclear reactor in the States, it's at least six years or more to put it like, to make it functional and Three Mile Island is three years, but we're still three to six years out from this being a viable energy source for AI. So everyone yesterday were, was like, what's gonna happen for the next three to six years? Yeah, because it's, your... it's exponentially growing. Like the, the guy yesterday from Lawrence Berkeley showed a plot and then uh, data center energy use was kind of plateauing because of efficiency gains. You know, we use more internet, but it's more efficient. And all of a sudden from 2019, it shot up. And then essentially that's, that's mostly generative AI, that's mostly AI. And the problem is, is that even big tech companies weren't expecting this. Like, you know, 2019, they weren't expecting this boom. So they're all scrambling to get energy and um, energy grid operators are also freaking out. Like for example, they're maintaining coal power plants on longer than, because the, they were supposed to like shut them down or whatever, they're maintaining them, they're keeping them online in order to power this boom of energy, which is like not supposed to be happening, right? I don't think anyone would think it's a surprise that the new incoming Trump administration who were focused on coal plants and didn't close them will definitely use coal and connect, if they can connect coal to nuclear because they do see that there needs to be a solution. But I just wonder how, as you look at the global landscape, because you've got the whole world, uh, AI and climate solutions. I don't know where you got that job. I don't know what you were thinking. That's really super big. But I don't know, uh, tell me how you, if you're talking to the new president of the United States or President Macron, what would you suggest that they could do? I'm not asking about a fast solution. I'm asking you what you think is doable today. I think that currently, um, especially state leaders don't really understand AI, and so they think it's like a, a unicorn or a, some you know unseen before technology, but it, it's actually like any innovation, like, I don't know, like the internet, like anything that we've seen before, it, it, you can do the same things. You can apply the same laws. Like, for example, if you have to decarbonize, if you have to reduce your energy usage, you can also write laws for AI. It's not some magical being that will, you know, elude uh, all legislation. And I think that they should start treating AI as not like some you know, magical future unicorn, but a current uh, technology that's being used by by billions of people at this point and start like treating it as like a concrete thing like anything else like they regulate the car you drive they should regulate the AI that you use and I think that there's this kind of there's this hesitation and this kind of misunder misunderstanding under understanding of AI that's really precluding world leaders everywhere of actually acting and so so I mean for me I would just say not not be bamboozled by these like foundation models, AGI, all of these claims of that AI is gonna either kill everyone or solve all the problems. None of those are true. It's just a technology like any other technology and you can regulate it, you can measure, evaluate it as any other technology. I think you should do this, go from country to country and tell them this vote is all for possible. Sasha. <laughs> is there, vote for Sasha. <laughs> Sasha, is there any country that you see that is actually doing any of the things you're talking about? Well, so what's interesting, we've seen a couple of countries that have um, said no more data centers. At least, at least temporarily. So Ireland, for example, said, because there's such a concentration of data centers in Ireland, that at some point it was like almost 20% of their energy. And so they were like, no, 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 no more. And so they, they cracked down and they're actually putting in laws because you know we haven't had this happen yet, thank God. But what happens if, for example, there's a cold snap and the data centers, they need energy 24 seven, but all of a sudden residents need more energy than before. What kind of trade-off? Like, who who can make these trade-offs? The, the laws don't exist, and so what they're doing now, they're actually like considering these kinds of 
so, uh, these kinds of uh, situations and being like, okay, what will happen? Like, what laws are in place and can we develop new ones, et cetera? And I think that these kinds of conversations should be happening. And, and maybe at the AI summit, these are the kind of discussions that will happen. Like, given, you know, every place's legislation, how does that, how can that be adapted to AI? I don't think we should be writing new legislation because that's going to take way too long. We should just be adapting. And, you know, yesterday at the IAA, there was some, like, former minister or something from Germany who was saying, well, this clause, like, 17 point BF from this law that was written in 1986 actually can apply to AI if we choose to include it. And so I think we should be making these kinds of, you know, almost backward connections and adapting them to current technology. Well, the regulators in the U.S. will tell you that there are existing laws everywhere to handle, not specifically about en energy. I'm not aware of that. But every single thing that's happened in AI, this is not brand new to your point. It is current technology. Thank you so much for being here today. We're together at the Elysee Palace. I think we both look good here. We should come back. Let's try to get invited back. <laughs> Let's Sasha, try. thanks for everything you're doing at Hugging Face. Thanks for having me. And thanks for watching the Washington AI Network.